Good evening. Good evening from Hong Kong. Uh, welcome to Asia Society Hong Kong Center. I am uh, Executive Director Alice Mong, and it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome, to make some opening remark and welcome our, our speakers uh, for tonight's program, which is named Track of Time, Moments um, of Transition. And how interesting. We are also in a moment of transition today. And so we're delighted uh, to have the opportunity to welcome uh, Patrick Drainsfield. Patrick is uh, based here in Hong Kong, has been a long time, long time Hong Kong resident, and he has a wonderful book out that I'm going to be showing to our audience. Uh, the book just got published uh, this month, and, uh, and it's a book of wonderful photographs that he took in uh, 1986, and he's going to share um, uh, his journey with us. Uh, uh, I think that's when he arrived, first arrived in Beijing and Datong in 1986, and, uh, and the book, uh, the, those photographs, the exhibition which I had an opportunity to see at FCC a few months ago um, is really, uh, it is a wonderful, kind of remind us of what China was like in the 80s. So tonight, um, welcome uh, Patrick um, to the program. And today we're delighted uh, that uh, Professor Rana Meter, uh, no stranger to Asia Society, is joining us from Oxford University. Uh, professor Meter uh, is professor of history and politics of modern China. And I remember, uh, I think it was uh, two years ago, maybe, or two or three years ago when Professor Meter was here talking about the history. Uh, uh, in, in fact, it was an anniversary of the Nanjing, around the time of the, uh, the Nanjing massacre. So we're really delighted that tonight we're welcoming you virtually, uh, thanks to the magic of uh, virtual internet Zoom. And so, and I also want to remind our audience, if you have questions for Patrick, please uh, uh, send your question in through Slido. The code is, should be on, the, uh, on your Facebook Live, on YouTube, uh, and, uh, and then uh, Professor Mita will be able to um, use the question uh, and, uh, and ask second half of the program to Patrick. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Professor Rana Mita. Thank you. Alex, thank you very much indeed for that welcome. And thanks indeed to the miracle of technology, many thousands of miles away here in a rather dark and gloomy skied Oxford, England. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to chair this evening's talk. And um, Alice did do you uh, a uh, service, Sir Patrick, by mentioning your professional connection with Hong Kong. You'll be known to many, I think, as the principal of Clearway Communications and until uh, recently a consultant at In-House Community. Also your past, of course, with uh, Euromoney Institutional Investor and working for companies including uh, Sherman and Sterling and White and Case. But I have to say that is not the main reason that we are here this evening, because it was a past life before that where, uh, as a student, you studied uh, in art history and English at Leeds University and then took a master's from SOAS in Chinese politics, history and anthropology, where if I'm not wrong, you studied under the legendary Stuart Schramm, you know, probably one of if not the great sinologist of that, that earlier uh, era of the, the 60s and, and, and 70s. And of course, you lived in China between December 1985, December 1986, working as a junior prof at the Beijing Normal University, uh, Beishida, and researching for Newsweek. And that, of course, brings us to tonight's event, because I have had a look at your, your website um, more than once, and I want to, in a sense, start you off with a quote that you've given on that website to try and explain why your fascination with visual arts and with literature and bringing the West and East together has been so important to you. And you, you say on that website, Patrick, it is my profound hope that through preserving these fleeting moments, meaning the photographs of Beijing street life from the 1980s, East and West can once again be reminded of our common humanity, our common needs, desires, hopes, and dreams. So this evening, after you've spoken, you and I will be in a short conversation for 10 minutes or so, and then we've got 10, 15 minutes to take question and answers from our audience. And again, I remind you, please use Slido at any point during the talk. You don't have to wait till it's finished, just send in your questions and thoughts, and I will collate them and put them to Patrick. But Patrick, it's a great honor, if I may, to ask you to introduce us to your talk entitled Tracks of Time. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and thank you all very much indeed for joining me. Um, Alice, it's a great honor. Since the opening of the Track and Time exhibition at the FCC in October, I've had some time to reflect on the many comments and reactions that these old photographs of Beijing have evoked. Many, many people have shared some private moments and emotional reactions when talking to me about the pictures in the exhibition. Some of these reactions and meditations make it into the book, 
uh, which I'm launching today, actually. Um, the book also includes observations made by my good friend Xiao Chen, a lawyer in Beijing, describing the China of 1986. And there's around about 700 of these street photographs um, reflecting, and he reflects his feelings and reactions to a selection of those photographs which make it into the book. It does appear as though my trove of photographs are a unique time portal to a China that on a certain level no longer exists, except in the collected memories of those that experienced it. I'm delighted that Professor Rana Mitter, who wrote the foreword to Track in Time, will be moderating our Q&A session today. Rana is a long-term friend of the Asia Society. In fact, I first heard him speak here in Hong Kong quite a number of years ago, a many times published author, this is my first book, and a globally recognized authority on China's recent past. So no one better to place these pictures into a personal and also historical context. To be honest, I was unsure whether the pictures in the exhibition would work and genuinely surprised at people's heartfelt reactions when they first went on the wall in the FCC in October. I did genuinely believe I'd be bringing at least 17 pictures back home with my wife looking at them thinking, what is going on? Um, they did sell, I'm very glad to say. Having had a month or so to reflect on the many comments that people have generously shared, I wanted to start with something a little bit different today and share some of my own reflections about photography and art. You see, I have, I have been surprised at the way these pictures have grasped people's imaginations, memories, and also feelings. And with so many friends and strangers even opening up about their own experiences when they were young men, women, and children. So these pictures have definitely uh, touched a nerve. I think one positive consequence of our collective experience through COVID is that we've all become more attuned to our own feelings and are prepared to be more open about them. But how and why do these particular photographs work to evoke such feelings? What are the purely formal mechanisms that trigger such reactions? And what is the wider significance of 1986 in China's history? So what I wanted to share with you in the first part of this talk are subjects that are not covered in the book, uh, but are nevertheless very dear to my heart, including what makes the successful photograph, why does it evoke feelings in different people in different ways? Does photography qualify as art? And how long has fine art been dependent on photo photographic techniques? And a quick spoiler on that, art, fine art has been actually uh, dependent on photography for a lot longer than you may think. And finally, what defines an epoch of constructive change, whether in China or Europe? Along the way, I will be sharing many of the photographs from China 86, some of which have never been seen publicly before. I'll also look forward to a lively Q&A where we can explore how any of the following, either my quite personal reflections or the photographs may have connected with you. So first off a photograph taken by me of Pauline and Philip Dransfield on the Lee River near Guilin. Both my parents were born in Yorkshire, a county in England. Yorkshire people call Yorkshire God's own country. So you can already see that people from Yorkshire have strong opinions. So I come from that tradition. But this is the first time in over 30 years that I've been asked to speak publicly about history, my photographs and art. Usually I've been introducing lawyers. I will be sharing with you ideas that have been on my mind since my days of studying art history at Leeds University. Uh, that's from 1982. And so please forgive if some of these comments seem jeune or just merely baffling. One thing I am sure of, the success of an art object depends on the artist's original intention. Picasso, for example, believed he was a shaman breathing life into a painting. A successful art object has a separate life to its creator. And if an art object's truth is somehow wrapped up in the creator's intention, then I would not call myself a photographer, but rather an artist that uses a camera to create art images. And I draw my inspiration from the great painters such as Rembrandt, Manet, Cassette, and Vermeer. By an accident of fate, I started studying art from the age of eight. In the late 60s and 1970s, my dad judged at amateur wine shows every weekend, and these shows took my mum and me to dozens of provincial art galleries throughout Northern 
uh, Northern England. First, she dragged me, and then I dragged her as my interest in art grew. I'm also ambivalent to label myself as a photographer, because when I first started taking pictures in the 1970s, I really was quite hopeless. My excuse that I was using the very worst camera available, the Zenith EM from the Soviet Union. Witnessing my early failures, my father declared me the worst photographer in the world. To be fair, he also declared himself the worst harmonica player. But because the Zenith was totally manual, I was not phased by the Siegel camera bought from one hundred, for 100 RMB in a pawn shop in Wanfujing in June 1986. And do allow me a quick divergence, as the Siegel camera is very much the star of this show. Now, here it is. And as you can see, it's actually got two lenses. Um, this is the lens which I'm actually locking down here. And this is the lens which goes into the back of the negative box here. So basically, I could be taking a picture of you, and I can be smiling and engaging with you, and uh, you'd be none the wiser. The second thing which uh, Rana referred to to some degree is that 86 was quite a different time, and uh, people had a different concept of time in that time. Photographs were something which you very rarely had taken of you, perhaps for your wedding, perhaps a first child. Nobody, in China at least, was taking street photographs with a camera like this. So to some degree, that is why they're unique. Also, it's not very threatening. I'm actually looking straight at you whilst taking a picture. Over the next 35 minutes, I will share with you some of the 700 photographs I took in the summer of 86 the ones that other people have told me they especially like. And we'll also embark on a journey through art history from the time of the Romans to the present day. And on our way, I hope to demonstrate why certain photographic images work and may qualify as objects of art. So we need on our journey to have four dates in time and two important words. Um, and these are our tickets and uh, our uh, the, the dates for our destination and the tickets for our journey. One moment of congruence is 1911. And I'll be talking about uh, 1911 in some detail a little bit further on. The word congruence is both a mathematical term relating to the meeting of lines and also a term that relates to agreement, harmony and compatibility among different disciplines. As we'll explain later, the congruent moment of 1911 to 1914 in Paris and Vienna brought together men and women from the arts and the sciences in a common mission to better humanity's understanding of both the material and the spiritual world. Our next date is 1986, and this is a moment of liminality. The word liminal comes from anthropology and relates to a transitional or initial stage of a process, a process of transformation. China in 1986 stood on the cusp of change, moving from the horrors of the Cultural Revolution to a better present and a hopeful future. Now, 2020 is another moment of liminality, as all humanity has been and continues to be challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic. 2021 is hopefully a moment of congruence, as we are on the cusp of dynamic change with the rollout of the vaccines. Experts in both science and the arts are now moving humanity forward. I pray for what social scientists call an emergence where people from widely diverse backgrounds and disciplines work together to bring common goals such as ending the pandemic and bettering the ecology of all living beings. So let's start with Dartang boys uh, and go back to 1986. I'd like to share with you why this image works, why it intrigues and satisfies the eye. Taken across from the Yungang Caves over the dry Shirley River basin, these two boys stand at a liminal moment, neither boys or quite men. And it's a moment at dusk, actually. We'd walked across uh, the river basement from the Yungang Caves, and uh, these boys were coming uh, from, the, uh, from the west and walking towards the east. Part of its success as an image, though, is related to purely geometric, geometric perspective, the congruence of its lines through the Western canon of art, we are used to digesting art images of the world from a monofixity, 
a monofocal fixity. Um, but actually a traditional painting is actually a mathematically constructed artifice. And as early as the 15th century in Italy, a camera obscura, essentially a box made up of mirrors and lenses, effectively a camera without the, uh, the negative, was used to help artists determine how to create a window on the world from the assumed fixed point of the observer. So we go to a, a painting by Piella della Francesca, Pier, Piella della Francesca, um, which is from the 15th century. For Piero, the creation of congruence expresses something more than just an image satisfying to the eye. His intention is to express the perfection of God through geometry, nothing less. Here is Piero's image of the risen Christ who has conquered time through time's mortal arrow. I first encountered Piero's paintings through the London National Gallery collection and also came across Bill Brandt, that most painterly of photographers, and that was in 1982. But Brandt is the exception that proves the rule for me. My personal inspiration lies with the great greats of painting, Vermeer, and this is a painting by Vermeer, The Little Street, uh, obviously painted in the 17th century. And this is a, a photograph that I took in Beijing, um, uh, obviously in the 80s, 86. Now, if you look at the um, two entrances, they're almost identical. And I guess the sort of feeling is also similar. Now, Manet, Follet Berger, very famous picture. And this is my kind of take of it, if you like. Um, I rather like this picture in terms of several details, like the, the girls selling by Joe, but you can also buy some bananas. So if you feel a bit peckish as you're drinking your by Joe, you can have some bananas with it. And I love the old Soviet light, which is in the right hand corner there. That was very much a, a feature of many hotel rooms and many uh, restaurants, etc. the kind of very old 50s style. This one is Rembrandt, Christ teaching and etching. And this one is winter cabbage after Rembrandt. And look at those lovely cabbages. This is obviously autumn time as it's getting a little bit cooler. And uh, I guess in 1986, we're all looking with some trepidation towards those cabbages because that was basically what we'd be eating throughout the winter. Now, Yorkshire artist, David Hockney, has written about the techniques borrowed from photography, such as lenses and mirrors that I referred to earlier, that have been used since the Renaissance to create monofocal art objects. And his contention is that um, Johann Vermeer used a camera obscura to help him successfully create portraits like these. By the late 19th century, English artists like John Atkinson Grimshaw, whom Mum and I discovered at the Ferens Art Gallery in Hull, used an actual camera that caught a landscape image onto glass. Atkinson Grimshaw then projected the etched image directly onto his canvas and laboriously copied it. But what is the point of a painted canvas that merely copies a photograph? Why not be content with the photograph itself. The same thought occurred to Pablo Picasso and George Braque, two young artists in the early 20th century Paris. They were determined to change the way we look at art and the way we look at the world forever. Now, this is a Braque from that year, 1911, and it's too, uh, too little time to go through the vocabulary of cubism here. But as you can see, it's a very, very different image to the Piero della Francesca image earlier. And the jug is repeated in various ways from various angles throughout the picture. There is no fixed point of um, access to this, this painting. And here's a Picasso from the same year. And you may consider this almost indistinguishable. This is partly because Picasso and Braque lived and worked together in the same studio. But even so, such congruency in artist in, uh, endeavor is unique. These paintings are masterpieces because both men shared the same mission to formally accept the limitations of an essentially two-dimensional space and exploit it into a new artistic vocabulary. As a consequence, they radically altered the painted image from the monofocal window on the world, dominant from the 15th century. What they achieved in those three short years was to create a multi-perspective view of painted reality called cubism. 
During this congruent period in Western history, their transformative work in painting was at precisely the same moment matched by Isaac Einstein in physics, who completely changed our perspective of time, Sigmund Freud in psychology, who changed the way we think about our minds and memories, Stravinsky in music, and Apollinaire in poetry. The great moment of Cubism between 1911 to 1914 was indeed one of the great congruent transformative periods for humanity. In the same spirit of 1911, the China of 1986 had its own cubist moment. Chinese people believed that their future would be brighter. China in 1986 was not a rich country, but just as in 1911, Picasso and Braque believed they were creating transformative art, in the China of 1986, all Chinese people were positively engaged in transforming China into a country which was confidently engaged in an enriching and equal dialogue with the whole world. Witness the work of Su Bing in art, Tian Zhuang Zhuang in cinema, Ba Jin and Wang Shuo in literature. And the following of my pictures from 1986 convey, convey some of that euphoria. This one is taken in Bei Shadar, and uh, uh, the, the, the young man is reading a book on, on how to learn algebra. It's my conjecture that being quite close to Zhongguancheng, where the first uh, technology revolution of China began to occur around about this time, uh, he may well now be a very successful man. He may be Chen Dongsheng, or, or a very successful uh, entrepreneur. This is a similar photograph and a similar theme. The calligraphy behind our young heartthrob is all about extra classes and also piano lessons. The trope of actually learning and making one's mind better was very much 1980s uh, phenomenon. Now this one is Billiard Girl Beijing. Now my friend Xiao Chun, who I referred to earlier, has been a very invaluable guide to me. This looks quite archaic to us, but in actual fact, um, billiards like this was the state of the art for street life uh, during the 80s. And uh, in the 70s, of course, very little street life and entertainment could be entertained. This one, First Love, Beijing 86. Xiao Chen has uh, kindly observed the fact that whilst it's very clear, I think to anybody looking at this picture, that these two are very much in love. Uh, they're not holding hands. They're holding mutually the same bag, uh, which is uh, uh, rather lovely. And we have this old pensioner couple. Um, I do believe actually our dashing young man or our heartthrob may be just uh, behind them actually. So I must have moved in front of uh, him to take this picture. And uh, again, their hands are matched. Uh, they must have had, I think, quite a dreadful time during the Cultural Revolution, but. Uh, uh, looking forward to a brighter future. And this one, the second ring road in Beijing. I, I don't suppose you'd see people fishing around Beijing these days. Maybe you would, I'm not sure. But a rather lovely, peaceful image there. Goodbye, mummy. Now, this one, I think, has got some historical significance in terms of the fact that uh, during this period of time, uh, many uh, people were beginning to go to the coastal towns, the uh, joint ventures were beginning, manufacturing was beginning, and many of those people were women. So I conjecture that uh, this is quite close to Datong, I think, that the, uh, the guy is literally left holding the baby and his wife is off to actually work in the factories. Now, coal, dust, and light, Beijing, not only does this indicate that coal was the main fuel and therefore Beijing was pretty uh, polluted at the time, but also you have the Ming Dynasty buildings around. And I really like this guy's hat. Even though people didn't have a lot of money, they had a lot of style in those days. And Datong, uh, this one is the scaffold where these guys are actually precariously uh, climbing to, to make a building. Um, it is actually metal they're using. This is northern China, so it's not the bamboo that we're used to in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Hong Kong. So I guess these are pretty heavy as well, actually. Now, happy grandparents. Again, this picture, I think, evokes something 
of the hopefulness of the period of time. This is taken quite near Beijing University and uh, the child, um, probably their one grandchild, uh, is beautifully dressed and they're obviously very proud uh, of her. Uh, Beijing's Edith Piaf, this one actually reminds me of Marc Roubaud, the Magnum photographer, who took a similar image in uh, 1950s uh, Shanghai of an opera lady with a fur collar, a Chinese lady very defiant in her uh, kind of uh, uh, right-wing tendencies, I would say, but a beautiful image and uh, one that uh, uh, I've tried to match with uh, this particular picture. This, this image here could have been taken by Hedda Morrison. Her book, uh, Photographer in Old Peking, was around at the time of this uh, 86. So I think uh, I subconsciously took in some of her images as well. And uh, this image could actually be even 300 years before. Um, so a timeless image there. And then this last one on this particular uh, sequence, I want to uh, change tack in a moment, but uh, uh, Children Under Mao is uh, very early. It's actually uh, on the campus of um, the university where I was teaching. Um, and actually 86 was the first year that children were compulsorily made to go to school. So whilst these kids look like pretty well turned out and perhaps professors' children, perhaps party members' children, um, their, their, their cousins in the rural areas were also beginning to get an education. Now, I wanted to pause a moment and change tack a little bit because with reference to Picasso and Brack trying to use the frame of the image to actually um, mean something. I wanted to actually begin when I'd actually got used to the uh, format of the Siegel camera to express something about the claustrophobia as well as the joy but the claustrophobia and the kind of surveillance one felt living on the streets in China and to do that formally through the actual um, you know, framing of the picture. So you'll see the young girl in Yam, she's thrust right up to the front of the, the lens and then you have a kind of projection of people behind. Um, this picture, uh, Hot Potatoes, is similar. This one is actually also historic for a different reason, which is that um, the, uh, the, the actually the Sin Jerko free market was one of the first free markets where people could bring their produce to town and begin to sell it for money themselves. It was not uh, owned by the state. And uh, you'll see in the sign behind that they're told they can only sell vegetables, not to do any underhand deals, to not cheat their fellow citizens. This one, weighing fish. Well, actually, the fish scale itself that this lady's using is a government scale. Uh, the guy behind, obviously, uh, perhaps is a little upset because she's not trusting his catty stick and is actually weighing her fish herself. And But water a pump in Datang. Now, Beijing at the time did have um, running water in most of the flats, at least all the ones that I visited. Not so Datang. So uh, this is, a, I guess, a historic picture in that way. You didn't want to get caught behind the night soil peddy wagons uh, in Beijing, though, where they'd actually take all the, all the sewage out at the end of the day. If you're behind that on a bike, you certainly felt that. Um, workers take a break in Datang. One of the reasons I wanted to, to sort of mention this is that the guy behind is stopped and listening to uh, what perhaps is the Lao Ban telling these guys and exhorting them to greater efforts. But um, social interaction on the streets was very much a part of 86, uh, partly because there was not much else to do. We were all actually having our teas by six o'clock and then, you know, everything was closed after six. Uh, most people were in bed and asleep by nine o'clock. So street life was pretty much uh, what there was. Now we have our first contemporary uh, picture here, which is Ai Weiwei, uh, the genius Ai Weiwei's um, carved white Carrara marble bust of a security camera. Now it's actually on a Roman pedestal. And to my mind, this self-consciously mimicking uh, the bust of the first century Emperor Augustus. And here's the uh, Augustus bust. So if you see the bottom of uh, Ai Weiwei's uh, security camera, you've actually got a Roman bust there and it's put on a pedestal in a way that actually uh, Augustus's uh, picture, uh, well, sculpture would be. And Augustus used this to show his authority throughout the whole Roman Empire. Every city, every town would have his likeness. Um, and that was to make sure people recognize the sole authority of the emperor. Now, China's population has always been much larger than Europe's, and it is impossible to feel alone 
and unobserved amongst one billion other souls. And there was the feeling of surveillance in China of 1986. Now, of course, all states surveyed their citizens. It is now part of modern living, after all. In 1986, it was the eyes and the ears of your fellow citizens and not technology that you primarily needed to watch out for. And this one is police altercation. A um, traffic accident, a very minor one, has happened and people are called around to give their testimony. Um, I was actually quite the beneficiary of this kind of surveillance, if you like, um, in 86, because uh, we were both me and two other of my Leeds graduates were on a pedi pedi wagon, and the guy actually got quite violent and started asking for a lot more money. And I waved my hand up in the air and I said, could people bring justice? And two ladies with red armbands immediately appeared or as if from nowhere and began a kind of small court as to whether this chap was actually extorting us or not. We were found to be innocent, I'm glad to say. Um, this one is a street sign. And basically there was not much in the way of advertising uh, in 86. Uh, you began to see some fashion shops, et cetera, coming about, but very few. Um, and of course, the bike was a huge uh, thing for most people. Most uh, uh, self-respecting young men would want a Shanghai bike. Um, and of course, there was a lot of traffic accidents as a consequence. Now, danger up ahead. Um, this is actually quite close to the Friendship Store, as was. And uh, basically, I think what I really find amusing about this picture uh, is the fact that, first of all, there's virtually no traffic around Zheng Guoman Wai. Uh, it's right in the center of Beijing. And also, to me, this picture symbolizes something about the, uh, um, about the kind of subversive humor of Chinese people that one found in the streets, which actually is something that uh, uh, Professor uh, William Jenner, my alma mater's um, university professor, refers to in his work. Now we come to some difficult, some would say unanswerable questions. What is art for and how does art function? According to the early 20th century art historian, Max Raphael, the experience of an art object depends on congruence, that word again, specifically the congruence of all of the following five factors. The artist, the world or the subject, the means of figuration, the way that actually the artist creates an image, the art object itself, and the observer. For a successful art object, it needs all of these elements to actually work. According to another art historian, John Berger, by working the artist's material so that the art object represents ideas and feelings, the artist transforms raw material into an art object. An authentic art object is both physical and spiritual, both an idea and a feeling that is created and perceived by the observer. Whilst transformative art is created at all times, certain periods create great leaps for the civilizations that artists engage with. But writing in 1969, Berger warned of a crisis in Western art when he was reflecting on his fellow Marxist Max Raleigh. A crisis born out of the monetary value appropriated to art. To quote Berger, art is treated as a commodity whose meaning lies only in its rarity value and in its functional value as a stimulant of sensation. It ceases to have implications beyond itself. To quote 10CC, art for art's sake, money for God's sake. And just as in 1969, the optimistic world of 86 was quickly eclipsed by the exponential growth of Chinese economy and with the rise of materialism. An optimism in the future and the vibrancy in the arts has, in my opinion, been lost. And as we reflect on my own time, have we lost faith in a better future? I believe that we are indeed in great grave danger of losing faith in a concept of history as human progress. And here's another question for me to end on. Is photography art? Berger believed not, but I believe a photograph can be an object, an art object, at least in the way that Cartier-Bresson defined in his photographs. So this is a Cartier-Bresson photograph. And what he had to say about his, um, his art was, the photograph itself doesn't interest me. I only want to capture a minute part of reality. To me, photography is the simultaneous recognition in a fraction of a second of the significance of the event. 
Photography is an immediate reaction. Drawing is a meditation. So for a photograph to function as an art object, it has to do the opposite of a drawing or a painting and capture a moment as purely as a photographer can conceive of it. We can conclude then that both paintings and photography are somehow wrapped and wrapped up in an attempt to express something about time. We can immediately grasp this with a successful photograph. But where has traditional art objects, specifically paintings, captured moments of time successfully? Well, uh, here's one of my pictures, which is obviously paralleling Cartier-Bresson, um, <laughs> I'd like to think anyway. Um, one way that uh, photographs, uh, sorry, art um, does uh, work in time is in a literal sense. Chinese and Japanese calligraphy is all about the spontaneousness of a gesture in time, but representing over 30 years of masterly technique. Now, uh, Naga, uh, Nagasawa Rosetsu, who created this image, only spent two hours actually creating a 100 meter uh, screen. Uh, that took 30 years of his own um, uh, training to be able to do that. Now, here's a, here's a painting by the um, 17th century painter called Nicolas Poussin that I think Piero, uh, Piero della Francesca would have appreciated. A, supply, a sublime expression of spiritual faith in a painting. Christ and John the Baptist are caught in an eternal moment, a liminal moment, if you will, whereas those on the bank appear to be having a picnic. Poussin is engaged with us to share with Christ and John the subliminal divine moment, the baptism of Christ, that through God's grace becomes an eternal moment outside of time. Now, here's an image by Pieter Bruegel, which is exactly the opposite. In the fall of Icarus, Pieter Bruegel expresses modern distracted time. Icarus dives to his death as sheep are led to a market. And here is Icarus. And to something, uh, to quote uh, W.H. Jordan, and the expensive, delicate ship, which must have seen something amazing, a boy foiling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. All they are missing to be truly modern is an iPhone. And since I'm surrounded in the room by folk with their iPhones, I can certainly consider that to be true. So nothing eternal is going on here. So I end on some images from 1986. One thing we can sure be sure of, that only through the time portal of photographs like mine can we return to that time. So this is students on an emperor's stele. You can imagine that um, actually nowadays, nobody would be allowed to sit on such an ancient monument. This was um, the emperor's uh, declaration to, uh, to, he, to, to people uh, from the Qing em uh, Empire. And uh, obviously these folk are sitting on it as a, as a place to take a photograph. Um, this one, is a very much a favorite of uh, Xiao Chen's and a very, uh, very favorite spot for many people to have their photographs taken. It's the northeast corner of the, um, of the, of the Forbidden City. Um, I would have cycled this way to get home. Um, obviously must have taken uh, off my bike and taken this picture, uh, perhaps because these guys are in pajamas for some inexplicable reason. Um, this is Hedgehog Man. A lot of people have asked me about this. Are the hedgehogs uh, <laughs> as pets? Are he, is he making them do tricks? I think the sad fact is he's hoping to sell them for food. Um, and uh, when I look at this image at the time in China and I was a young man, I didn't really recognize the poverty around me. I was somewhat, uh, um, you know, insulated from it, I guess. But um, it's, it's a pretty desperate thing to be selling hedgehogs for food, I have to say. Um, the penultimate picture is the artist. Uh, Corro, the landscape artist from the 18th century, was a particular favorite amongst oil painters in China at that time. I guess oil painting was relatively new uh, uh, for, for many artists uh, in China in 86. And finally, um, good mind, uh, it's actually Madonna and Child. Um, I'll finish on a quote from uh, Cartier-Bresson. Photographers deal in things which are continually vanishing, and when they are va vanished, there is no contrivance on earth which can make them come back again. If there's anything certain in this life, it is that we will not be returning to our 1986. And we collectively need to work harder to not simply reflect back with nostalgia to a better past, but strive together 
to make a better present and future. We owe it to the people and their humanity captured in these images. Patrick, thank you very much indeed. I think you can hear a sort of virtual round of massive applause coming from the various points in Hong Kong and uh, elsewhere where people are, are listening in. I'm really sorry that Zoom doesn't allow us to, to relay uh, those. Um, it was an absolutely captivating lecture combined with pictures which, as you say, combine both immense skill. I mean, in some hands, you know, the comparison to so many of these old masters might have been a really quite dangerous tactic to, to take in terms of comparison, but you brought it off, I thought, with huge success. Uh, and I must say that Madonna and Child at the end, of, of, of all of them, that was really one that I thought was absolutely fan, uh, fantastic. Um, there's a huge amount there to talk about. And I also see from looking at Slido and please encouraging everyone listening and do send in your questions. We've already got four or five come in, I see, and there'll be plenty plenty more, I'm, I'm sure. But before we do that, if I may, I'm going to steal a bit of time just to reflect a bit on what you've given us and also add a few thoughts, which might also add to the, the wider conversation with the, with the audience. One of the reasons I found the framework for your talk so captivating was that you made that very explicit comparison between the moment of modernism, if you want to call it that, 1911 and the years afterwards, and the 1985-86 period when you were in China and taking these, these pictures. And in a different context, many years ago, I realized actually to my horror how getting old I'm getting, in a, in a book I wrote nearly 20 years ago, 17 years ago anyway, on the May 4th movement of 1919 and its afterlife, that in some ways, not through visual images, but more through literature and, uh, and, uh, and philosophical thought, I had also been captivated by this idea of maybe an earlier moment of modernism and modernity, uh, two related but different terms, and the 1980s as well. Um, and in some senses, and I think many on this um, uh, lecture call will be very aware of the May 4th movement and its uh, uh, comparisons and contrasts, so I won't go into too much detail on, on that, but I would like to if I may, just give you a few thoughts again from that earlier work, which I hadn't looked at in years, but sort of reminded me of quite what a world China was in the 1980s in terms of the so-called Wenhua Re, the cultural fever, which really um, you know, consumed at least many people like without the dashing scholar uh, and possibly even the heartthrob who were in those, those pictures that you, uh, uh, you showed us. I mean, again, I was reminded that one of the key um, intellectual magazines at the time, Du Shu, uh, still very much in existence in somewhat different form, which had had a sort of earlier incarnation back in the 1920s, uh, in, in fact, uh, although under rather different management. In the year following that you were there, you were there, 1987 to, to, eight, uh, to 1988, um, considered the following, um, I mean, just a selection of the following foreign uh, influences, uh, the Welsh poet R.S. Thomas, the American anthropologist Margaret Mead, South, Af South African novelist Nadine Gordimer, and the Sovel Soviet Nobel laureate Boris Pasternak. And you mentioned Coro there as one inspiration for painters, but I think it's a reminder that actually the outside world was bursting into China in all sorts of different ways at that uh, time. The magazine, of course, was also writing at that time, and this is something we also forget, I think, and it is really worth reminding. You mentioned those Soviet lamps in that picture again, wonderful detail. Sometimes we forget that the 1980s was the last period when the United States and the Soviet Union were both going strong, Soviet Union wasn't going as strong as we thought it was, but nobody knew that at the at the time. And that China, in some ways, was torn between both. You know, this huge Soviet influence, which, of course, after the split of the 60s was less uh, explicit, but still very real. And the lure, the promise of the United States as this new, not quite friend, but certainly a country with which China was friendly at that time. And again, in Dushul magazine in, in those years, the mid 1980s, their correspondent at Harvard was one of the people who uh, kept on writing in, not least on questions of enterprise. And I was very amused to note that um, one of the uh, writers in that magazine at that time, I don't know if he brings it up much these days, uh, was a gentleman named uh, Wang Huning, who has uh, gone on to uh, rather uh, senior roles in the Chinese government, let's put it, uh, put it that way. So a really important reminder that we don't just look backwards, we can look forwards as well in terms of the China of today, as you say, it's very hard in some ways to relate it to those images of 35, 36 years ago. But at some level, you know, many of those people and what they did still very much with us. Let me, if I may, just read a couple of extracts from some of the thoughts of young Chinese of that time who were picking up on a lot of things. But you mentioned the word 
entrepreneurship, you showed us the Zio Shachanda, the free markets and all of these aspects of there's markets opening up and the culture that, that, that came um, came with that. Um, you know, the mat I, I, I've got here from that, that uh, 1984, 1985 um, uh, period, um, one uh, manager of a new magazine declaring, I've started things off with a magazine correspondence course. I wanted to target on, on young people interested in getting a higher degree by doing a correspondence course. So we've used the magazine and my magazine also provides readers with information on how to pass exams, as well as publishing self-improvement teaching materials. There's a knack to passing exams, especially the way that the examination system is set up here in China. And I think with the Hong Kong audience, you don't need me to belabor the point that so much of this, A, you know, sums up, I think, a great deal of what you see in, in the eyes, the facial expression. You know, there's young people sitting on that steely at the end there. Maybe they were going back home afterwards to get on with that correspondence course, learning English, learning accounting, learning business, whatever it might be. And of course, today, even now, if you walk into a bookshop in, in Beijing or, or Shanghai, you'll see a uh, success studies, self-improvement area in that, in that bookstore, which will look very familiar in tone and in spirit to many of the people in the 1980s. Just um, one more here, if I, uh, uh, if I may, from this, uh, uh, this particular um, period. Um, a 34-year-old man named um, Feng Yichun had developed a local building and repair team into a large construction company. And I find myself wondering, with those building sites, you know, was he or someone like that, you know, sort of a few yards away, maybe actually kind of supervising the, the scene? We'll never know, but it's nice to think about. And he said, this is again uh, about 1980, 85, 86, 85, I think. Now I'm the manager. My wage is 115 yuan per month, same as a grade 14 state cadre. So a very Chinese comparison there. On top of that, I get a responsibility supplement and other things that bring it up to 290. The joke is I get more than the mayor. And again, that's a very mid-1980s sort of sentiment, I think, amongst the, the Xiaohai youth, the youth jumping into the sea of commerce and, and business. Then he goes on, of course, some people object to me making this much. We've been making revolution all these years, they say. This is all we get, you so-and-so. And what I'd like to ask, he says, is how many of them do as much work as I do? People say what they like. The situation's changed. Well, indeed, the situation had changed so much in the mid-1980s. And I think your pictures bring that to mind very, very much as we go back to, as you say, as Cathy Bresson said, a moment that can't be recaptured. And I think that is one of the things that absolutely, whatever else these pictures are, makes them art. I want to go in a moment, Patrick, to questions from our uh, audience, uh, which I'm gathering up on, on Slido, and please keep keep sending them in. But just a couple of questions back and forth to you before we, we do that uh, in the next uh, few, uh, few minutes. Um, when you look at that 1980s period, um, Patrick, and that year that you were you were there. You know, you've said that obviously it's very different, but there are also echoes with with with, with the present. Where do you think the most important connections, and where are the most important distinct uh, distinctions with that period? Would you say what what endures, and what really has gone forever? Do you think? Sorry, could you repeat the last part of the question? The question is what what endures, and what really has gone forever. Right. Okay. Well, that's a that's a that's a very good question. Um, I think what endures actually um, is that um, you know I haven't been able to go to China uh, for quite some time, um, like nobody else. You know, we've all been locked down. My intention was to actually have these photographs exhibited in Beijing um, in January, um, and um, uh, that obviously hasn't happened. And and um, uh, what endures for me is the fact that people uh, on the streets and people generally still have a great deal of camaraderie, great sense of humor, um, and, um, you know, uh, are, are very engaged, uh, usually, you know. I think what has changed is that people are distracted, they have less time. Um, and um, that, as I make the point, you know, in, in my room, when I finally moved to um, campus, I was actually living with a Chinese family for, for quite a period of time in Zhongguanshan. Um, so that was for about three or four months. So when I finally moved on to campus, um, there was actually a recording device in my room. I think there was a recording device in many people's rooms. Um, so surveillance continues. It's just in a different form. Uh, but I think the general uh, humor and uh, humanity of, of, of uh, Chinese people um, still endures as well. Thanks for that. And 
did you feel yourself, as it were, as, as part of a wider movement in terms of you know the changing artistic perception of what was going around you while you were there in 85, 86? You know, were there Chinese photographers, were there friends that you made there who were interested in what you were doing, interacted with you, maybe did something similar themselves? I'll answer that in, in, in two ways, actually, funnily enough. Um, I've made the reference to the fact that actually my experience in China was a little bit different from yeah. a lot of people on VSOs or, or, or Fudan University, uh, Leeds University folk who were on these years um, at, um, uh, at uh, uh, you know, on exchanges and mm -hmm. things like that. I was very much um, there um, with my girlfriend at the time um, and living a different life. I was actually living in a Chinese home for quite a long time, etc. Um, so I was very much engaged with my own thing. I would actually be cycling 40 kilometers a day to do the various things that I did and uh, then take pictures along the way. So that was the thing. Adrian Bradshaw was taking photographs and I did know Adrian and he was working for Newsweek at the time. Um, I think what made my particular time a bit more, um, you know, uh, unique, why these pictures may resonate a little bit uh, more differently is because of the camera. And that's purely because I'd broken my Nikon. I didn't have any money. So I bought it for 100 RMB on one Fujing. Didn't know how to use it and tried to figure it out. So I guess on one way, I was aware of other people, uh, but I was pretty much plowing my own furrow as well. Well, that leads us very nicely into some of the questions that have been coming through for you from our audience, uh, Patrick. So maybe I'll just turn to some of those. And first, um, well, actually, it's two questions, so we might get both parts in, um, from Ron. Uh, and Ron asks, what was the most difficult and slash or rewarding shoot? And I don't know if the most difficult was necessarily the most rewarding, but, you know, how would you, because uh, presumably these wonderful images, they didn't just come because you happened to sort of be walking by. They must have taken a certain amount of negotiation and uh, some, some uh, missed, uh, missed opportunities too. Great question. Um, Vivian Mayer, who's somebody who I uh, have admired, I mean, she got posthumous fame because of actually some of her negatives and she used the same camera, but never even processed. So part of the thrill is to try and capture that moment, even if you don't have the final result, is that click you're going for? So it's a very interesting question. On the one hand, the pictures I look at and think, I must have been bad, uh, was the Dartung scaffold, because I was actually lying underneath those guys with those metal rods that they were kind of lassoing around. And uh, I don't think I'd put myself in that kind of danger again. And uh, I also crawled underneath a loco locomotive train, not when it was moving, but I crawled underneath a locomotive train to see if I could get the wheels going. That was a pretty crazy kind of picture. Some of the ones actually came out quite well. There's one um, of the Beijing Underground, which is in the book. Um, and um, I'm particularly fascinated by that because I've learned quite a lot about how uh, Mao was inspired by the Soviet Moscow Underground and how this was then sunk into the moat of, uh, of, of, uh, the, uh, of, of the old city walls and has actually had huge ecologically appalling uh, consequences as a result of destroying the water archeries of arteries of, um, of, of Beijing. So that one fascinates me. And it's taken actually, obviously, in quite low light. And the one thing I'll, I'll generally say is actually most of the pictures are not staged or posed. Um, there was perhaps some conversation in my very poor Mandarin uh, to gain people's trust or whatever. I didn't want to take pictures that people would feel humiliated by. I, I never want to capture people's souls through photographs. Uh, but the thing that I've recently tried to use this camera, and here it is again, and it's a, it's a very difficult thing to use. You only get 12 pictures. And out of the 700 pictures I took, most of them came out. And that would have required me actually changing the film at least three or four times. Um, I'm just a bit surprised that I was getting in such a zone that I was able to take pictures quite consistently, um, you know, uh, with quite a tricky piece of... Uh, there was no light meter. I was guess, guessing the light and the aperture all the way through. Well, actually, Patrick, that leads us very nice to a question that's coming from Chris Rides, who says, you always stress the importance of the dark room and developing your own photographs, which of course is a dying art. So tell us how your technique helped these photos. And I should add on the back of that, this is 35 millimeter black and white, is it? That you're using no, this here? is actually um, a mid format. So it's 120 film. So there's oh, only God. five wow. pictures per, per thing. And I'm going to confess wow. to you, 
I'm not very good. At, I, in fact, I don't do any backroom. Uh, Danny Chow, um, who is well known in Hong Kong and has got the contract for that special German paper and uh, has uh, helped me clean up some of these images, needs to take some credit for the darkroom. Um, I'm very much like Vivian Mayer. I just uh, like the click and uh, then move on. So no dark room technique from me, I'm afraid. None of these images are cropped in any way, actually. And that's kind of the way I take pictures in any case. I, I tend to like the idea that they're an instant record of what's going on. So none of them have been, you know, they've been cleaned up by Danny, but none of them have been cropped. But, but just to be clear then, Patrick, uh, did, did you in fact develop them yourself or did you sort of send no. them? No, oh no, that was a okay. great thing, you see, I mean, there are virtually no photographs of me at Leeds University in 82 to 85. Um, I was keen on photography, but couldn't afford it. Um, and it was an expensive, and can be still an expensive habit. And the, the point is also, now iPhones didn't exist. So one of the things that um, particularly younger folk can't, you know, need me to explain to them is that, um, you know, uh, mm. to have your photograph taken was quite a, quite a unique event in somebody's day. Nowadays, we're all taking selfies of each other and everything else like that. But images in those days were, were, were pretty rare and, and hard to come by. Um, so, yeah. No, great, uh, great question. Um, one that's um, come in uh, from, uh, not, not named, but a very good question, which is how do your mainland friends look at these, what do they say about these pictures now? Both presumably the older generation who might actually remember the 80s and of course younger people who you know, like young people elsewhere have no memory of the 19, uh, 1980s. Well, that's a terrific question, actually. And it's one that um, is a little bit sad for me in a certain way, because as I said, I was very keen to have this exhibition in Beijing. I'm very fond of Beijing. Um, I was very welcomed to that city and uh, wanted to give back an exhibition about um, things that I cared about, of having, having really enjoyed living there. But very few people from mainland are obviously in Hong Kong. Um, two or three came to the exhibition, and I was delighted with that. And one one couple came in, um, and uh, the reaction is interesting. I'll, I'll I'll talk about their reaction momentarily, but it's very different from Western folks' reactions. Even Western folk who've actually lived in China and experienced a similar experience to me. Most Western guys of about my age, first of all, start telling me about how I would really like their pictures, because men tend to be a little bit. Um, uh, competitive, shall we say. So that's our first reaction. Um, Chinese folk have been much more measured in how they've approached these pictures. Uh, they've resonated with them, but on a different level. And I'd really like to do the exhibition in mainland China, because I think um, um, they, they, they will resonate, but in a, in a completely different way. The, the couple that came in um, spoke about the fact that uh, there was a couple of photographs about bicycles and this and that. And he said, well, I remember when I got my bike and it had to be a big bike because I wanted my girlfriend to be able to be on the handlebars. And this was going to be my kind of like, um, um, you know, my, my, my lure to find a girlfriend. And his wife nodded. She was obviously the lady that sat on his handlebars all those years ago. And, and he said, the next thing that we, you know, you would get. So I'm not saying people weren't materialistic in those days, it was a different type of materialism, actually. So um, if you look at the picture of the uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, first love, they're actually, the guy's wearing a watch, right? So he's obviously not a student, I think. He's obviously a professional of some kind. And um, that was the next thing that you got. You got the bike and then you got married and the guy would get a watch. This is what Chinese people told me. And the wife would get some jewelry. And then you'd get one of these cameras for when you had the first child and the only child. And that was to share with the grandparents the, uh, the uh, fruit of your, your, your relationship. So a very different type of materialism. Um, and uh, the reaction of um, Chinese people, I guess it's also a time where China is so much more affluent now. And I guess it might be a little bit like my parents looking at photographs from the 40s, where England was a little bit deprived. They may have a different take to it to how we see it. I mean, I was able to leave um, and, um, you know, a lot of Chinese people were very keen to improve their lives, improve their minds and improve China. So a very different period, very different reaction. Thanks for that, Patrick. Uh, a quick factual point, uh, I think, that uh, came in from one of the questions. Someone asked about the name of your professor and it was in fact W.J.F. Jenner, Bill Jenner, is that right? J-E-N-N-E-R. I just wanted you to confirm yeah. that name. 
Yeah, yeah so Jenna, actually, he's famous for a couple of things. He, um, uh, he's famous for translating The Monkey King and famous yeah. for being a Leeds University Chinese language professor. He ah. was at um, the uh, Foreign Language Institute whilst I was there. I didn't personally know him very well, but he was around and friends of mine had been tutored by him. But his book, Tyranny of History, which was published in 1992, if you've not read it, I urge you to read it. It's a fantastic uh, look at China from somebody who understands the language, but is obviously a foreigner to China. So a very, very fascinating book. And he makes a lot of um, uh, points about the fact that um, Chinese street culture, Chinese um, uh, you know, kind of folk art and everything else has always been there and always been a reaction towards centralized power. A wonderful point. In fact, one other thing I'll be urging people to do is to certainly look at these photos and indeed buy the, the book. And just remind us again, it's called Tracks of Time. And how can people obtain it in Hong Kong? Presumably it's directly available uh, online. There we are, Tracks of Time, Moments of, of Transition through, no doubt, all good bookshops, online retailers, and so forth. Um, well, actually, had... only me, really, and also the Asia Society. Okay, well, <laughs> through the Asia Society. Far, but there's, uh, there's, uh, there's been, throughout the whole... Uh, uh, interview actually there's been my website so we'll, we'll click back to a slide with that okay through the website in that case a very good way to uh to 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 to, to, to do it um i'm sorry that time is uh, oppressing us and bringing us towards the end here Pat. it's been a wonderful hour to hear not only a talk which was informed by a rich knowledge of, of, of art history brought to bear on some fantastic historical photographs and of course, a very lively conversation with our audience. Thank you to all of the team, Alice and the team at the Asia Society. Thank you to you, Patrick, and for me, Vladimir. Great pleasure to be hosting today from a very long distance from Hong Kong. I hope to get back to visit you in person at some time, uh, sometime soon. And have a very good rest of the evening, and hopefully see you again soon. All the best. Thanks, thank everyone. you all very much indeed. Thank you, and thank you for participating, and thank you for listening. Uh, it's been a privilege. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you.